today we're talking about uh, vectorized execution. So we talked a little bit about this already uh, with when we talked about sort merge join. join. Um, but now we want to go a bit more detail and talk about how we can do uh, vectorized execution for more operators in, in, the, in the system. So we'll again start out with more background about SIMD in general and hardware that we're going to be looking at. And then the paper you guys are assigned to read is, the, in my opinion, the, the definitive guide from these guys at Columbia on how to do vectorized algorithms for all different operators you want to do in, in a relational database system. Now, uh, I, think, I think, like I said, I think it's a good instructional guide to tell you how to do this. The spoiler would be, I'm going to just tell you up front, is that it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> now, let me rephrase that. It doesn't, the assumptions they make about the operating environment are not realistic. It, do you ever take a guess? Do you ever know what, they, what, what the sort of two major assumptions they made that, in, in, given that what we've talked about so far, we know are not going to be true? One is they assume the database sits in your, in your caches, CPU caches. That's not real, right? The second one was that they assume that you have 32-bit keys and 32-bit pointers. So that means that the things that they were uh, they're processing are going to be 64 bits. That's not going to work either because we're going to need 128 bits, right? We need 64, at least 64-bit keys and 64-bit pointers. Now, back then they didn't have AVX 512. We have that now, so that's not that's not that big of an issue. But the the main one is that everything has to fit in CPU cache, and we'll see this uh, next class. So yeah, Wednesday. So Monday's class, uh, I'll show you a technique that we developed to how to overcome that that limitation of how to avoid the you know. We'll, we'll see why we go along. Why the cache misses make vectorization come fall apart and not work, and then we'll see a technique on Monday how to hide that. All right, so again, we've already sort of covered this. Uh, we already covered why, you know, what, what, at a high level what vectorization is doing, but now we want to go into a bit more detail and talk about actually what's going to be happening in the hardware and how we want to design our algorithms to, to, to use it correctly. So the idea of vectorization is we're basically taking an algorithm that we would normally process a single data item at a time with a single operand, Right, this was the SysD, single, single instruction, single data uh, that we showed before. And then instead what we're going to do is have a, use a single operation to process multiple items of data at the same time. Right? And it should, should sort of be obvious, given that we've talked about so far why we actually want to do this, but to put into context of everything else we've talked about, the speed up we can get if we can vectorize our, our operations are going to be quite significant. So we've already seen how in, to do the hash join, to do our scans, to do our sort merge joins. We already, see, so we already know how to do parallel scans, right? So say we have 32 cores, we can have all 32 cores scan our, our database or tables at the same time. But now, say that if every single core has four wide SIMB registers, so four wide means that it can process four data items uh, uh, at, at a time per instruction. So if we can run uh, we can run on 32 cores and get uh, a four times speed up on each core, then it's multiplicative. So at 30, at, for all 32 cores, you're getting a 4x speed up because every single core is processing four data, eight items at a time. So that means we're getting 128x speed up, uh, which is massive. Right? So this is, this, again, this is why we want to do this. Now, in reality, we're never going to achieve this is, like, you know, this is the upper bounds. We're never always going to get this. Because, as we'll see as we go along, you know, we have to move things in and out of the SIMD registers. Sometimes we have to do extra instructions to put uh, data in a form that can then be loaded into the register and then get it out. Right? So this is, we're never going to achieve this exact, uh, you know, at, at, at this level of parallelization. But you know, this is the upper bound, and this is quite a lot, so this is something we want to work towards. So the things we need to talk about a little bit, and this is mostly relevant because the paper you guys read, but it highlights, again, the, the, the issues between the different types of hardware that, are, that could exist and that we have to run on, is uh, we, you know, the type of hardware we, we, we're, we've been assuming we're going to run on are like our standard Xeon processors, right? Skylake, KB Lake, I forget what the latest one is, Coffee Lake. Um, and in these type of modern CPUs, you're going to have a small number of cores, but each core is going to be super high powered. Right? I mean, they're, they're going to have the full instruction set, a bunch of SIMD stuff that they can do, and a bunch of other stuff that we don't care about in databases. But, it, but it's basically a, you know, it's, it's a, every single core is, is high powered. And so as part of that, in the Xeons, they're going to be doing superscalar execution, which we've already talked about. That means we have a, 
We can execute multiple instructions uh, at a time within a cycle in our pipelines. Um, and then we also do out of order execution, meaning we don't have to execute instructions in the order that they appear on, in, our, in our instruction stream for our pipeline. We, the CPU can be smart and say, well, I know this one's going to have a cache miss, so let me go ahead and maybe, maybe load that, that thing in, into to my caches from memory, but then I'll execute these other instructions while I'm doing that. And then it tries to make sure that, that if there's any dependencies, to make sure, you know, does this instruction depend on this instruction, it makes sure that it'll stall or, or not, you know, not execute that one until the data that, that you need is produced by this other instruction. So there's a bunch of magic going underneath the covers to execute uh, multiple instructions out of order, and then, then the CPU makes sure that it appears as if they're executing in order, right? Because again, you, you don't want to have this thing produce incorrect results. So this means that they're going to have a long structure pipeline. There's a bunch of extra stuff they're, they're going to have to do. If you have, you have the, you know, the branch prediction stuff we talked about before, but we'll see, see it again in a second. There's a bunch of stuff they're doing to make this all happen. Um, and that means that the way we maybe want to design our algorithms should be aware of what's going on so that we don't end up having the CPU do stupid things for us or slow things for us. Now, in the paper you read, they also talked about this other type of processor. Uh, the brand name from, Z from Intel is called the Xeon 5. But this is a, what's considered a many integrated core uh, CPU or MIC. And the idea here is that rather than having a small number of high-powered cores as you did in the Xeon, they're going to have a larger number of sort of low-powered cores. So it means that the, 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 the clock frequency of every single core would be less than the Xeon, and the amount of uh, sort of specialized instructions that they're going to have are going to be much, uh, much more limited than, than the Xeon. So in the paper you guys read, they ran on an older version of uh, Xeon Phi called uh, Knight's Ferry. And again, Intel is afraid of getting sued based on names, so, so all these correspond to like geographical areas or lakes or rivers or stuff like that, right? So that's, again, that, so they can say that no one, you know, that no one can claim that Intel stole their name because they say, you know, it's a, it's a river. Of course we didn't steal it, right? Um, and so so, right, so the, the Knight's Ferry you guys, that, that was in the paper you guys read, this was an older version of this, so this was a non-superscalar in-order execution uh, uh, cores. So it didn't do all the stuff that the Xeon did. Um, and every single core itself is this, follows this I ISA, the Intel P54C. And so that was the same thing as the, in as the Pentium, uh, I think Pentium 2, Pentium 3 from like the 1990s. Again, but they're just running a, a ton of them, having them on a single form factor for the, for the, 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 for the processor. The later version that came out uh, after the paper you guys read came out is this thing called Knight's Landing. Right? So this one, they actually said, oh, well, actually, we do want to have the superscalar out of order execution the same way the Xeons do. So the newer Xeon 5s that you can get have that. And now these are based on the Atom uh, ISA, not the, pen the Pentium. Um, so the key thing, though, about that's going to be relevant to what we're talking about today is that the, although we're going to have a, the cores themselves are going to be low powered, they're going to give them a lot of, 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 of really wide SIMD registers. So now you can do, on every single core, you can do a vectorized ex op operators, ex execution. And in the paper, again, from, from Columbia, because we're non-scalar, superscalar, and because we're doing in order execution, they're going to favor things that are branchless. Because um, they just sort of execute things as fast as possible that way. All right. Uh, in, if you've never seen what these things actually look like, you can get them in three form factors. So you, uh, the most common way is to get it almost like a GPU, uh, or just like a GPU where it's something that sits on the PCI Express, and then the, the main socket CPU is the one that's actually controlling the OS. You can also get one that sits in a, in a, in a, as a, as a self-boot CPU. So this thing could actually run the operating system and, and control the whole, whole motherboard. And then they have this thing with this little connector called OmniPath. Um, think of that as like RDMA. Uh, or like a, it's a messaging fabric that allows you to 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 read memory on a, on another on another machine very efficiently, right? So I had this uh, every year. Intel killed this. It's not I think at this point, but like they don't make these anymore. Uh, they are I don't know how I don't. They didn't really sell like, that that yeah they didn't sell. No one ever people wanted these GPUs because that because these things are not. Like you get like 70 cores or 60 cores in these things. The GPU gives you like 5,000 cores. So for, for, like, for like neural network training and machine learning, the GPUs are way better than these guys, right? Um, 
what Intel is actually doing now is this thing called, or the, the future is that they're going to do things, something called configurable spatial accelerators. So I sort of think of that as like a TPU that has like, you know, in a, in a, in a sort of PCI Express form factor or something that sits up on the, on the socket up there, right? So this thing's not cache coherent, right? This thing is, uh, uh, this thing is like the, the, the central processor, the, the main CPU has to you know, send data back, back and forth between this thing. Whereas this one, I think it was cache coherent with the main, the main CPU, right? All right, so, um, for, okay, so for SIMD, we've, we've talked about before, so I don't wanna go spend too much time on this, but again, the basic idea is that SIMD is a class of instructions that, is, that are gonna allow us to do the vectorized execution on some, some sort of basic primitive operation. And all the major ISAs have, have their own versions of this. It comes up in different names, different flavors. And basically, x86, going back to the 1990s with MMX, when, when these first, first SIMD stuff come out, like, as they go over time, they're adding more instructions, more operands that can do, do, uh, to do that are vectorized, as well as expanding the, the register size. Meaning you, you have, the, the lanes are wider, you can operate on uh, larger, larger pieces of data. So we already showed this example here. We want to do this addition between these two vectors, and we would implement it with this for loop. And if we were doing SISTI instructions, we would just go through in, in our thread one at a time, looking at each, each data item in our array, and then invoking the SISTI instruction to add them together. But if you wanted to do this in SIMD, we basically have a, we, we collect some data into, to, in this case here, it's a 128 bit SIMD register, so a four, four wide or four lane register. We put our, item, our, our data items in there. We invoke one SIMD instruction, and then it spits out, an, or it writes that result into another register. And again, what we'll see is that, like, this is in memory. We load this into a register. We invoke our instruction on that register, and then it's going to write to another register. And then we can, we're going to have to go get this out and put it back into memory if we, if we want to use it in a rest of our program. Or, depending what algorithm we're, we're doing, we could have uh, these register, this, this register then be used for another, other SIMD operations uh, to without having a, to put it back in the cache. And that's sort of the best case scenario because we can keep things in our registers as long as possible. That's how we're going to get the best performance. So, uh, SIMD, again, as I said, Intel has been adding SIMD for, uh, uh, you know, improving SIMD over, over uh, several years. The first time in the 19, 1999 when the, the, the SIMD instructions actually became usable in the context of databases or things that we actually care about was this, the first implementation of the streaming SIMD extensions. Um, and in this first version, they were these 128-bit registers that you could pack with four 32-byte th uh, scalar values. Um, and then this first version also, or this, the first version of, of SSE allowed you to invoke SIMD instructions while the main CPU was doing other stuff. And my understanding is the first version of MMX, when, when Intel first announced that we have vectorized instructions, it was basically uh, like it, the CPU, the main CPU would stall or it would not be able to execute, you know, SISTI instructions at the same time it would execute SIMD instructions. It would have to switch back and forth. Whereas in this one, you can sort of do both in, 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 in parallel. And so the class of operations you can get are sort of the, the again, low level primitives that we're going to need to build up and do more complex things in our database system. So of course we can move data in and out of our registers. We can do the arithmetic, arith arithmetic operators. Um, we can do all our Boolean operators to do comparisons uh, and predicates. And then uh, we can move data in between, uh, between the different SIMD registers without having to put it back in the cache. But the, kind of the, some of the more important things is that they're going to have the ability to convert data uh, into the x86 format, into, into the format that the SIMD registers want. And then we're also going to have sort of fine-grained control of where we move data around from, you know, how do we move data back and forth from the registers to, to, to memory. So the, the, the streaming in SSE, that class of instructions, or streaming instructions in general, are operators or instructions where you can bypass the CPU cache and write directly to, to memory. So you don't pollute your cache. So let's say that yeah, I have a data item where I do whatever operation I want to do it, or whatever instructions I want to do it to, 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 you know, to crunch on it. Normally, I would then write it back, you know, the result to my, my CPU cache. But if I know I'm never going to read it again, then I can use a streaming instruction to dump it off to memory right away, right, and not worry about polluting my CPU cache. 
So there'll be some techniques where we can take advantage of this where again, we know we don't need the data right ever again and we can, we can shove it off. Yeah, sorry. Um, is selective store and gather from the paper and not fundamental operation? Yeah, so he's, his question is, is select a store and gather, are they not fundamental operation or symbi instructions? Correct. So the way you have to implement them is like a, a small kernel that does uh, a series of symbi instructions. So there's no like select a store instruction to do exactly what the paper describes. And then every year I Google this and see whether, the, does this actually exist? Uh, like, did, does, does the Xeon actually support this yet? And as far as, again, as of, like, again, uh, as of last night, it still doesn't exist. If you Google, you know, SIMD Selective Store, you get three things. You get my slides, you get the Columbia paper, and then you get this guy in Korea that stole my slides. Um, <laughs> so as far as I know, it, it, it's, it, you, yeah, there's no single instruction to do this. All right. OK. And somebody else in Wisconsin stole my slides too, but that's OK. All right. So this is just the history of, of, of SIMD uh, in, in x86. And again, you just see that over the years, the registers get wider. We, you know, in the original MMX, it was 64 bits, and then 128. That actually makes, makes it usable for us in databases. And then 256 was AVX2, AVX1 and 2. And then as of 2017, uh, they, added, um, they added AVX 512. And we have one machine uh, in, in the database group that has this. Right? And this is, again, this is what I said when we talk about sort merge, like the, the, that, you know, the, all that sorting stuff didn't work if you only could do uh, sorting on 32-bit numbers. Because, um, again, you need, you need a pointer to the tuple that you're sorting. You just can't sort the key. With 512, you can actually do it. Now, I also look to see whether Intel is going to add 1024-bit uh, uh, SIMD instructions. Again, there's no reason they couldn't do it. Just I haven't seen anything that says they're doing this. But again, for our purposes in databases, this, this is sort of the threshold what we need to be able to actually use this in, in a real system. All right. So let's talk about how we actually can take advantage of SIMD. All right. So it's clearly that, that this, this seems useful. We want to use this. It'll speed things up. So how do we use this inside of our database system? So there's three approaches. Uh, there's the automatic vectorization, you know, getting from the compiler. There's us telling the compiler what, you know, what it can try to vectorize. And then the last one is, is what they did in the Columbia paper and what we do in our own system is we actually just invoke the intrinsics directly to, to do explicit vectorization. So there's this great uh, talk. Um, this link here will take you to this video from James Rendiers, who was one of the lead architects or the lead uh, proponents of the SIMD vectorization architecture at, at Intel. So he sort of lays out a bunch of these uh, you know, how you can actually do vectorization in these different ways here. But at a high level, the way to think about this is that the, the two, two, two ends of the spectrum are at the very top, you get ease of use, meaning us as the data system programmer. And the bottom is like how uh, the guarantee that you're actually going to get things to be vectorized and have complete control over actually what the CPU is doing. So the top one is basically we just write our code without thinking about vectorization and hope the compiler finds it for us. But then the, the bottom one here is like we're telling the, comp we're telling the, the, the compiler we, ha we want this ac absolutely vectorized. Do they cover this kind of stuff in 4.18, 6.18 or no? Yes? Okay. But not everyone has taken it. All right, so let's go through the, each, each of the three approaches. So again, automatic, automatic vectorization is us getting, getting on our hands and knees and praying that the compiler can identify different parts of, the, the, of our code that can be vectorized. Um, and it's basically going to be looking for loops where it knows that the instructions could, are independent and therefore those, those can be replaced with, with vectorized instructions, right? So the downside of this, of course, is that the compiler is never going to be perfect. Um, and in many cases in our database system, the, 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 the candidates for vectorization are going to be rare, right? Because our loops are usually not going to be that simple. Now, remember when I talked about vector-wise, they had those loops, those primitives, they were doing like you know a scan on a column and applying different uh, uh, you know predicates. So we will see that approach next class and next paper you read, and that's a good example. It, it, I, in that paper, it'll tell you what percentage of, of the operators could then or, or will be automatically vectorized, and it's not 100 percent, right? So let's look at a simple example here. So we have a simple function here. And we're going to take it in three vectors, and we're just going to add them together. It's the example I showed in the beginning, right? So I'm going to take a guess whether the compiler can auto automatically vectorize this for us. 
Is he saying yes? Raise your hand if you say yes. Raise your hand if you say no. Raise, raise your hand if you say if you don't know. Good. All right. Good. The answer is no. Right? Why? Well, what are we doing here? I just understand the word can be over there. What's that? I just understand the word can be over there. Correct. Yeah. So, X, Y, and Z might actually be pointing to the same address. Right? This, this, is, this is something we don't know until runtime because we don't know what the values are going to be passed into us. So Z could just be the address of X plus you know, some offset. So in one iteration of this loop, I'm going you know, write, write to uh, write to Z, but that's going to write to something in X. right? So this is not like unrolling. right? Unrolling would just say, just, just replace this with the instructions executed you know, all in a row. Right? This is trying to take a bunch of data uh, at the same time, and then invoke a single instruction. So if there's a side, if there's a, if if one of the one of these addition operators modifies the uh, the contents of one of our arrays, then we're not going to see that in our vectorized operation because it's going to happen atomically, right? So this is this is sort of the, the downside of C or C plus plus because. We're writing our code as humans in a way, we're describing what we're trying to do in our, in our algorithm in, in sort of a sequential manner, right? Iterate over this and, and do this one by one. But what we really want is, is the hardware to be able to execute this in parallel, in, in, in a vectorized form, right? All right, so this, so again, this is what I was sort of saying, like, like it just seems like this would be super trivial, add two, two arrays together and produce a new array. Seems like this is something the compiler could find for us, but it, it actually can't. So how can we fix this? Well, one approach is to use compiler hints. So basically, we're providing information about the, to, to the compiler to tell it that the code that it's examining as, and, you know, as it's building it, we, we're going to let it know that this, it's going to be safe to vectorize. And this can be done in two ways. One is we say we give it sort of uh, explicit information about the data, the memory locations of the data that, that we're trying to operate on, and can tell it that they, they're not going to overlap. And therefore, it's safe to vectorize. Or we just, you know, we're driving our car and we, we take the seatbelt off. And we say, ignore all dependencies that you may be looking for, and you'll be fine. Just go ahead and, and, and vectorize this, right? Of course, again, that may not be what we actually want to do, right? Because again, if, if if we do this and we get it wrong, then our select queries are now going to produce incorrect results. And, and unless we're doing approximate query processing. You know, people are going to notice that you know we're getting the, we're losing money in the database, right? Or we're getting more money than we should have. So the first approach, again, the way to handle this is is, is the restrict keyword. So this is in this this is in the C ninety nine standard. I don't think it's in the C plus plus standard, although I haven't checked for C plus plus seventeen or the newer ones. But every single compiler actually uses this, so it's not a big deal, All right? So this is basically telling us in our function that with this restrict keyword, it's saying that these member locations are distinct, they're not going to overlap, and therefore it's safe to, to, to vectorize them, right? So, essentially the way to think about it is they're, 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 like, X, Y, and Z are not aliases of each other. It's, it's, we're, we're sort of saying that explicitly, right? Um, the other approach now is to use these pragmas, and this is how to tell it to ignore dependencies. So, I, I don't know whether this is in the standard or not, right? Um, but this basically IV dep says ignore vector dependencies. So this is saying that everything in, in sort of this code block here, we can, we, you know, it can ignore dependencies and it allows it to, uh, it can go ahead and vectorize it. And of course, now this relies on us as being dis disciplined programmers. If we start, start doing this, right, this is like taking the seatbelt off or taking the safety off our gun, right? We can still pass in pointers or values to these pointers here that do overlap and therefore the vector, this vectorized instruction stuff will get messed up. But it's, up, you know, it's up, up to us to make sure that doesn't happen in the rest of our code. Right? There's other ways, other, other um, libraries and frameworks have, or compilers have different pragmas. Like in, in OpenMP, it, there's pragmas, you know, SIMD. It, it, they, as far as I can tell, they all basically do the same thing. Right? All right. So the last approach is to do explicit vectorization. And this is what, again, this is what we're going to uh, mostly talk about today. Um, and the idea here is that we're going to use CPU intrinsics to tell, to basically invoke the exact instructions we want to invoke 
to do our vectorized operations or vectorized primitives, right? Now the downside of intrinsics, right? Intrinsics are basically syntactic sugar for humans. It's basically a, it gives you, a, uh, it looks like a function, but it's really a, it's a really just the, the low level assembly instruction that does the SIMB operation. And the downside is that they're not gonna be portable. Like all the examples I'm gonna show you here, they're all gonna be x86, you know, either AVX2 or SSE you know, intrinsics. Then if you, if you go try to plop that on your power PC machine or your, or your ARM machine, they're gonna have different instructions or different intrinsics and it won't work. Right? There are libraries that can sort of hide this for you, but there's no one that's that, that everyone adopts. Right? It's, 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 it's varied. And as far as I can tell, most people write you know, x86 code for databases and, and they, they do SIMD, they're gonna do, they're gonna do these intrinsics. All right? It's also a to write these things too because they're always abbreviated and every single time you gotta figure out what the looking at, you gotta look at the table at the Intel's website. All right? it's, it's, it's not intuitive. Um, at least for me, because I'm not writing SIMB stuff all the time. All right, so here's the intrinsic way to do that addition between two, uh, the two arrays. So now the first thing you see is that we are passing in our, our, you know, our, our regular integer arrays, our pointers to our integer arrays, but then we're going to cast them and convert them into our, our SIMD-able uh, primitives, or our scalar data, or not scalar, our SIMD data types for x86, right? And this M128 is telling us that it's a, uh, this is for the 128-bit the SIMD registers. So we're going to be able to take four 32-bit integers and stick it into one register at a time. And then in our, in our for loop, we have, uh, for every single four elements that we're looking at in our arrays, we're going to load them into our SIMD register. Uh, so we're going to load the, the addition op operation between the, the first register and the second register and write it into our, the, the Z register there, all right? So this is sort of clear. Um, you know, the underscore underscore stuff is, is, it is what it is, it's fine, okay. All right, so there are different types of SIMD operations or instructions that we can do. Um, and the way I think about this is like, it's the, in what direction are we applying our vectorized instruction and producing the output? So the first is horizontal uh, SIMD instructions. And the idea here is that for thin, within a single SIMD register, I'm gonna do whatever the instruction that I wanna do for all the elements inside that register and then write it out somewhere else. All right, so say I have a SIMD register that has the number zero, two, one, one, two, three. If I have a SIMD addition that's doing the horizontal operation, it's going to add 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 and then write it out to 6. Right? It's horizontal with, within the register. The vertical instructions take, uh, take elements across two, two, uh, two different registers across the same lane, apply the instruction, and then write them out to, a, uh, to another location. Right? So this is taking 0 at the first position here and 1 here, adding them together and producing 1. 1 and 1 produces 2, 3 and 4, and so forth. Right? So, the first approach is only really found in newer CPUs, the horizontal ones. Um, so it's in SSC4 and AVX2, so new meaning like, you know, last 10, eight, year, eight, 10 years. Um, the vertical one is, is pretty, pretty much supported by everyone. And in the, the Columbia paper, they choose this approach. They're always gonna do the vertical SIMB stuff, right? But just in the back of your mind, just be aware that you could do this, you could do the horizontal one. But for their purposes, uh, they're doing nothing but the, the vertical one. So the kind of things now using explicit uh, vectorization that we're going to be able to, to, to support in our database system are essentially all the low level primitives of, of sort of not even within the, the query plan, but just like within a single operator query plan, all the stuff we have to do in order to execute and process data, we can start vectorizing those things and use those as building blocks to do more complicated things. Right, so we're going to be able to do vectorized predicate evaluation and compression. Then we saw last class how to do vectorized sorting and merging, and then we can do even more complicated things like doing hash tables, which we'll cover here today. So we sort of start small with, with sort of small vectorized operations, and then use those to build more complex algorithms or more complex techniques. Right. So again, that, that's part of the reason why I like this paper so much. All right. So again, the Columbia paper. Uh, it's not a real system. It was just a testbed system that really only has the algorithms. 
So, you know, they're not actually supporting SQL. They don't have a query processor or anything like that. It's just like, here's a bunch of data that's in a columnar format. And then here's the, the little kernel of the algorithm that's been vectorized. So the paper again but light, lays out a, a, a clear example of how to vectorize a bunch of the, the core things we care about in our database system. Um, and the two overarching principles in, in, in their decisions of how they design their algorithms are that, as I already said, they're going to support ve vertical vectorization over horizontal vectorization. By, again, by, it means processing data uh, in two registers across the same lane offset. And then they're going to maximize the lane utilization by making sure that every single time they invoke a SIMD instruction, they're always producing useful work. And what I mean by that is like, uh, they're not going to have you know useless data in our SIMD registers. They're going to they're going to they're you know say I, I say I, I do some operation in, in the SIMD register and then some data I want to keep some data I I I I, I uh, some data is it's the correct result some data I need to process more. They could just keep using the same registers over and over again, essentially doing waste and work in some of the lanes. But instead, they're going to go back and get more data and make sure for every single SIMD instruction they invoke. Every lane is actually being uh, is actually doing something useful. This doesn't make sense now. It'll make more sense when we talk about the hash table stuff, right? It, it, it should click right away. All right. So the things I'm going to talk about first are how the low level fundamental operations that we're going to vectorize, and again, we're going to build up from these and then start to do more complex things like the hash tables or, or the histograms, All right? So we do select a load and store, and then select a uh, gather and scatter. And as Tanu already asked. For uh, these two guys here, there's no SIMD instructions that actually do it. They're going to emulate it with multiple SIMD instructions. For the gather and scatter, I don't think the CPU that you guys read in, the, in that paper supported these things. I think AVX 512 does have it, though, um, in, in the newer CPUs. All right, so the first one is selected load. The basic idea here is that we want to take some contents we have in memory and store them out to specific lanes in our SIMD register. So we have again. This is this is memory, but it, for for I mean it's it's the CPU cache, right? But it's it's yeah, it's it's not a SIMD register. It's it's the CPU cache, but I'm saying it's called a memory. And then this is our, this is our four lane vector that we want to write into. So then we're going to have a mask that's going to tell us where do we actually want to store data, right? So again, the the way to think about it is that these are matching to the same lane. So whatever offset you're in the mask corresponds to this this lane in the register. So for this first one here. The, the mask is set to zero, so we're going to go ahead and skip that. That's basically telling us that we're not going to write anything into this lane here. And what's going to happen is that as every single time we have a one, we're going to take whatever our current position is in memory and write that to that particular lane, and then move the cursor over by one here. So this guy here is a one, so we're going to go ahead and write the, where our cursor starts off at, at U, and we're going to write that into this lane here. Next one is zero, so we skip that. Next one is one, so we take the V here and write it out to that, that lane there. All right. Select and store is the reverse. So the, uh, the, the top is our target. We want to take contents of our vector and write it out into memory. And same thing, we have a mask that's going to tell us whether we actually want to write data here. All right. So the, so the lanes match up just like before. So the first one's a zero, so we skip that. The next first one is a one, so it says we're going to take whatever is in this lane and write it out to the first position there. Next one's zero, skip that. Then we have a one, and then write the, the, that lane out to this position here. All right. So again, the idea is that we ideally we want this to be vectorized, uh, and to have one instruction just do this for us. In practice, that's not going to be the case. All right. So selective gather. Uh, this is this is different than how we describe gather and scatter in a distributed database. Distributed database gather scatter or scatter gather is you take a single query break it up into to, to some sort of plan fragments, scatter them across the different machines, and then gather the results back. Right? This, is, this is within the single memory context. All right, so again, for this one here, we have a value vector, we have our index vector, and what's going to happen is these are going to correspond to offsets in our, in our, our, our sorry, in memory. And so what will happen is this one here will tell us that we want to take whatever is that offset to, 0, 1, 2, and write it out to this lane here. Same thing, right, for all, for all the other ones. So this is basically allowing us to take some chunk of memory. I think it has to fit in, 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 in our cache line, right, because we don't want to, like, you can't jump too far ahead. Um, 
but it's going to allow us to take memory that sort of can be in any any order and write them out to the order that we want in our in our register like that. And I think again, I think this can be done in in, in newer CPUs with a single instruction now. S scatter is the is the reverse. So this one here, we want to take uh, our index vector, and that's going to tell us that where where do we take the contents of our our SIMD register, and where where do we want, we want to write them into into memory. All right. All right. So this is clear. So no, I say actually take back what I said before. The the Memory itself, in both cases, this actually might not fit in a single cache line. So this may be, may be multiple instructions, or sorry, multiple cycles to, to, to perform this operation. Um, what I'll also say too is like with, with, uh, with L1, you can only do like one or two loads and stores per, per cycle. So even in that case, even if it did fit in a single cache line, it may take two cycles to actually do this. Right, and actually, this, this is what I'm saying right here. So again, the gathers and scatters are not really executed in parallel because you can only do so many things on L1 per cycle. Um, the gathers are only supported in newer CPUs, and as I said, the, the selected loads and stores are, you can implement them uh, using multiple SIMD instructions. There's no sort of single uh, load and, selected load and store instruction that you can just use. All right, All right so now, using sele uh, selected load and store and scatter and gather, we can now talk about how we actually want to do, you know, SIMD stuff in our database system. What we care about. So we've already talked about how to do, um, you know, uh, parallel partitioning, right? That was the, you know, that was that was the Radex stuff. Um, the scan stuff we'll talk about here today, and the hash tables to talk as well, and, and as well as histograms. The the paper also provides a bunch of extra other stuff: join, sorting, and bloom filters. Um, the the balloon filter one is sort of straightforward, right? Because you're just doing multiple probes into to your bitmap. The join stuff is a bit more complicated, and I will say that in our own research, we found that actually once you once you go beyond the CPU cache, SIMD doesn't help at all, right? The vectorized version actually is, ends up being worse than, than the scalar version, um, just because the, the, all the instructions to prepare things to put into SIMD registers, you get you get no benefit. Um, the sorting one was the, the, the big tonic merge sort stuff that we talked about uh, last class as well. All right? And as I already said, they're assuming everything fits in CPU caches. They're assuming they're operating on 32-bit keys and 32-bit pointers. In AVX 512, we can, we can bump that up to 64-bit, and then everything actually works. So let's talk about how to do a vectorized selection, selection scan. So we already talked about this before, the, the issue between branchless versus branching uh, scans. Right. So again, we're doing a simple, simple, uh, you know, simple select. We have a low key and a high key. And you want you want to check to see whether the tuple matches matches the, the predicate. And so, in the branching case, you have this if clause, uh, and, and depending on whether that gets satisfied, you go down to this chunk here. Uh, in the branchless case, you always do the copy. You always and then just do this predicate, and that decides whether you move the offset in your output vector forward or not. And remember, we said that in a uh, in a in a superscalar uh, CPU that supports out of order execution and uses a branch predictor to to speculate to execute instructions, uh, this approach can be will, can hurt you because if you predict incorrectly, which is going to be often the case because the data is going to be completely different every single tuple, then this ends up being slower. Whereas this one, you're going to do more work always. But you 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 don't have that branch mis misprediction issue, so you're basically running at bare metal speed. So we saw this graph before as well. Again, as the as you change along the x-axis, the selectivity of the predicate, the the branching uh, the branching version of the selection scan could either be better or worse. Whereas the no branching one is always doing the same amount of work, no matter what the what the data actually looks like. Yes. Uh, can you go back to the previous Yes. So, uh, last thing though, the discussion, if you would have thought you could add versus if it's to do branch prediction, actually, like if, if you replace that logic and add the bitwise and that goes away. So, this doesn't work for uh, branch prediction. You have to replace the, uh, the bitwise and. This thing here. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. So, he's basically saying, yeah. You have to do a bitwise and not a logical and, remove one and percent. Yeah. Good, thank you. I will fix that. All right. So, 
In the SIMD version, we're going to, we want to be branchless because there's no if clauses in SIMD instructions, right? So for this one, to make things simple, I'm going to have, uh, well, again, we're going to iterate over uh, vectors of tuples in our table. This, this is like super pseudocode. This, you know, this is obviously won't compile. Uh, and then I'll have, you know, instead of the actually intrinsics, I'm just going to say SIMD, SIMD load, SIMD store. So again, we're always going to load our, our data into our output vector. And then we're going to check to see whether the, the, or the tuple we're evaluating um, is, is matches or not. And that tells us whether we want to uh, uh, you move our output buffer ahead or not. So yeah, we load the key into our key vector. We do the comparison in SIMD, and then based on that, we get a the SIMD store tells us which tuples match that predicate, and we and then we, we can go ahead and write them out. So the key part is sort of you know this can be done in a vectorized manner, but this one here we're relying on the the again the the, the selective store to make sure that we only whatever tuples actually match our predicate, we get that mask, and that tells us which ones we actually want to write out to our output buffer. So it's sort of like we're always loading, loading things in to do, do comparison for everyone. And this is just making sure that we only write the, the small number, amount of data that we need. And then this part's a little bit complicated. But basically, if um, for every single element in our, in our, match, our mask vector that, that is a 1, we, we, we increase our output buffer by that amount. Right, so if nobody matches the VM zeros, and this, this returns zero, so we don't move forward. And then for every single one that it's, we have, then we, we get that. Um, I think that's called the, that has a, there's a simple instruction. I forget what it's called, though. It's, not, it's like a cardinality, but it's, it's different. OK. All right, so going back to, so again, let's actually see visually what's going on here. Right, so this is that, that predicate. So this is the query we want to execute, but now we're going to fill in values O and U. So, Let's say our data looks like this. We have a single table with the keys uh, J, U, Y, S, U, X. So again, the first step is we're going to load that into our key vector. That's what the SIMD load is. Then now we're going to do the SIMD compare here. And again, we get back now our output mask, which is going to be one, one if it matches, zero if it doesn't. And then now we can use this. We can use, use a pre-computed uh, SIMD register or vector that says, here's all the offsets that, that these lanes correspond to. And then we can use that to do our SIMD store then, then just to write out the, the tuples or the keys that matched. Right? Is this clear? So like I said, uh, when you do when you Google like selective store, selective load, uh, there, there's it's only papers that it's only slides or discussions about the Columbia paper itself. And then I know people are copying my slides because people also copy uh, Joy sucks in here, right? <laughs> huh. But not not knowing what it is, anyway. Joy is my former my, my my first PhD student. He doesn't suck. He's awesome. Anyway, okay. So look at, look at some results here. So again, this is an older version of the Xeon Phi. That means that it's going to do in order execution, and therefore, like it's not going to have any benefit of the branchless scan because it's not going to do that speculative execution to have any branch prediction problems, right? So when you look at the branching version. Right, the this one is actually going to run faster because it has way more cores. Um, actually, what's surprising is that it's this is not a typo, right? Every year I, I'm like 61 cores. That doesn't sound right, right? It really is 61 cores. I don't know why it's an odd number. Like you think it'd be 62 or 60, 60 but no, it's 61. Um, so the 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 Xeon Phi is going to perform better because it has way more cores than the Xeon. Um, but when you look at the the branchless version. It does worse than the branching version because, again, it's doing, it's always copying things even though it's actually not going to need it. Whereas in the Xeon, which has out of order execution and speculative, uh, you know, speculative execution of instructions, the branchless version does better up until the point where the selectivity uh, crosses this threshold and, and therefore you know, they, they're, they're basically doing the same amount of work or they're both performing the same. Because right? here you're hitting, you're hitting your memory bandwidth here. Right? So again, I love this graph because it shows you clearly the difference between branchless versus branching in an in-order versus an out-of-order uh, CPU pipeline. So let's look at that, the, 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 vec the vectorized execution. So they're going to have two implementations. They're going to have one that does early materialization and one that does late materialization. So late materialization means that uh, you don't actually copy the tuple that satisfied the, the predicate. 
in the output buffer of the of, of the, the scan operator. Right? You, you, you're going to materialize it some later part in, in, in the, the query plan. Of course, now, as I said, this is not a real database system, so they're never actually even doing that late materialization because they're not, they're not executing anything beyond this filter here. Whereas an early materialization, materialization is that after the filter matches, then they have to copy the tuple. All right, so for this, uh, the, 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 uh, the vectorized one with late materialization works the best here. Um, Again, so the vectorized one is is branchless, um, but that's okay because you're you're copying, you know, you're, you're, you can vectorize everything. Um, and the difference here between the early materialization and the late materialization is that actually I don't know why this is actually better. Um, yeah, because if if your selectivity is zero, then nothing matches, so you're not really copying anything. Uh, I don't know why that's the case. Right, but again, it, you know, as more things match, then you have to copy, and that's why they both converge. In this case here, the, there's no difference, right? Because the the, you know, the copying is is not the most expensive part, right? So again, looking at this roughly, remember I said before that you're never actually going to achieve exactly the speed up that the vectorization can give you, right? So in this case here, they're doing branchless. So this is doing maybe 2.25 or 2.3 uh, billion tuples per second, which is a lot. Uh, and if you say if you're going to have 4x, then you would imagine this thing would be uh, you know, 8x, but it's not, it's 6x. So even though, again, this is not a full database system, it's not doing a bunch of other stuff that's interfering with this, it's just doing the scan, you're not getting the true 4x speed up. Because there's a bunch of extra stuff you have to do to prepare things to put into registers and get the data out. Right? And again, yes, 61 cores is, is weird. Okay. So any questions about the scans? So for obviously more complex scans, that may be difficult to vectorize, um, but you can basically break the predicates up and do them in, in, you know, in piece by piece. And the goal is if you have more complex predicates or more, or more complex where clauses, you try to keep the data in the, in the SIMD registers for as long as possible. And only when you're done evaluating to decide whether it should actually, uh, whether it matches or not, then you bring it back into to memory, back into your CPU caches. Okay. All right, so let's talk about how to do hash tables now. So for the, the scalar non-parallel version, non-vectorized version, it's pretty straightforward, right? We have an input key, we're gonna hash it, the hash gives us some offset in our, key, in our, in our hash table, and assume we're doing linear probing, right? We just jump to that location and then do our comparison between whatever our key is and whatever key's in there, and if not, it doesn't match, we just keep scanning down until we find the match that we're looking for, right? Again, we can do this in parallel. We can have multiple threads do this probing in parallel, but now we're talking about within a single core, how do we make that core itself run in parallel with, with vectorization? So there's two approaches to do this, right? The first one is to do horizontal uh, vectorization, and the idea here is that we're going to expand out now within each slot in our array, or in our hash table, each bucket now is gonna contain four, four elements, four data items. So we're going to have a, a vector of four keys, and then we'll have a, a vector of four payloads, so the, the actual tuple itself. So for a given single input key, right, we get now our hash index, and then we're going to jump into this, this location here, and we're going to get back four keys at a time that we can then apply our, 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 our SIMD compare on. We'll get back a, a mask that'll tell us which, which, of these tuples, uh, which of these keys actually match. match. If zero, if they're all zero, then we know we need, we need to go down to the next one and do, do another, another comparison. If we find at least one match, then we know we found the key that we're looking for. And we can do some arithmetic or some, some, some bit shifting to figure out at what lane we're, our, our, our one is actually in, and that's going to tell us which one we actually want. All right. So this one, actually, I think is pretty decent. Uh, the What are some downsides of this? No, I, I mean this, this. This works. This is this is fine. Wouldn't this require some blocking if you're doing concurrent inserts? His question is: Would would this require some blocking if you're doing concurrent inserts? No, because you would do a, you do a compare and swap on the on the key slots. Okay. If you get it, then then you're in. All right. Um, yeah, this seems reasonable. I forget why this didn't this didn't work as well when we actually run it. Um, yeah. Okay. The other approach is to do this in the, the vertical one. Um, 
so actually, going back to this, I, I think the, as I said, the only the newer CPUs support horizontal vectorization, but that's okay because the newer CPUs have it and you know, we're not living in the past. Um, I'll have to check with my student why, whether he actually implemented it this way and, um, and what happened. Okay, I'll, find, I'll try to find that, find that out by Monday. All right, let's see how we do this using vertical, uh, uh, ver vertical vectorization. So for this one, instead of hashing, looking at a sort of single key at a time in our probe, we're going to take a vector of keys and do our lookup in parallel in our hash table. So we have four keys here. Then we're going to hash all of them. So this is not going to be in parallel, right? This has to be done sequentially. I, there's no, as far as I know, there's no SIMD hash function we're going to want to use. Like murmur hash is more complicated than what can be done in a single instruction. So this is, this is done in a scalar form. But then we fill out in fill out our, our hash vector, and now that's going to jump to a bunch of different locations. And so we're going to go do a SIMD gather to pull in the the keys that we matched on into a SIMD vector, and then now we can do a SIMD compare, you know, across lanes to see whether we have we have matches, and that gives us our output vector, right? Our our, our mask to tell us which ones are actually going to match. So in this case here. For key one, two, three, four, we only had a match for key one and key four. So again, we have a one here and a one here and two zeros in the middle. So this goes back to that point I was trying to make before about always utilizing our, our lanes. So what can we do here? In, so say we know that key two and key three didn't match. So that means that we need to now you know, scan down, bring in, the, you know, bring in the next keys, and then do our comparison again. But we know the first one and the last one already match. So if we don't replace them, then we're essentially going to be doing wasted work. So we're only going to get 50% lane utilization because these guys already, we already know what the answer is correct. We have what we want. We're looking for you know, the middle two ones. So unless we replace them with some the new data, then they're going to be, end up being just wasted work. So what they're going to argue that you really want to do is then go back and get two new keys to then fill in uh, into our vector, I'm oh, sorry, and to, re to replace two and three, I'm uh, sorry, replace one and four with now five and six, right? And then for this one here, H2 and H3, again, we're just incrementing our offset by one because we're doing linear, linear probing. So there's extra bookkeeping they're going to do. When this mass vector comes out, they're going to recognize, oh, these guys already matched. So let me go back now and move my cursor down for the keys I'm scanning to get the to get two new keys to then I can fill in to my, my SIMD register and do my comparison. You're making a face as in, if you're confused or it's a bad idea? Simply bad idea. Yeah, so, yeah, he's, <laughs> it's a bad idea. Well, it's, it's, just, it's just a lot more work, right? Uh, I, mean, I mean, actually, when you think about it, though, uh, let's say that, like, if you don't do this and say three doesn't match, and it never matches. That means I'm, I'm still going to rip through and you know, I'm going to be invoking these instructions and not getting anything useful out of them. Um, I mean, you could say you have to do this in the scalar case as well, but. This is also on the in order keys. Say it again? I said this was also on the in order CPUs. His question is is this also in the in, the in order CPUs? We're going to do both. Okay. That's the next slide. Um, So his, so his suggestion was, if I'm 50% utilized, then I go back. But if I'm 70% utilized, just keep going. You could do that. I, I don't think they did that, though. Yeah. Um, that just sounds like more more instructions, but that's not hard too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what's another potential problem with this, other than it seems like more work? It's a bit more nuanced, so it's okay if you don't get it. The issue is that, uh, and this is mostly a matter for us from a software engineering standpoint, is that our query results are not going to be stable. Meaning, if we execute our, uh, our, we, we execute our, our join today and then execute the same join immediately afterwards, we may get a different ordering for what we put in our registers, and therefore we may get a different output. Now, in the relational model, there, the, all the results are un unordered anyway, so this doesn't matter. Who cares? But in terms of actually like debugging this, trying to re re reproduce funky, funky results, then this can be problematic, right? I 
I sort of buy that argument, but again, from from an end user standpoint, it doesn't matter. If from implementation standpoint, it, it can it can be tricky. All right, so let's look at results. So again, the same thing, the, the Xeon 5 versus the, the, the regular Xeon. Um, so they're going to do the scalar, scalar version and then the vectorized horizontal, vectorized vertical one. So again, the, the, no surprise, the, the Xeon Phi, even though each core is less powerful than the, the, than the regular Xeon, it has way more, more of them, so they can, for, it can get better performance. But in the, right, and then the numbers look like this, right? The difference, though, is in the, is in the vectorized case. The vectorized horizontal one does actually really, you know, does not do much better than the, the scalar version here. I forget why the paper said that that's the case. But the vectorized vertical one, even though it seems like it's doing a lot of uh, extra work, you're getting full lane utilization, so it's, it's, it's able to rip through it much more quickly, right? In the case of the Xeon one, the, again, the vertical one is better up to this point here, whereas this one is um, almost always better. Um, Again, I forget why this is the case as well. Uh, I think at this point, though, as the hash actually as the hash table gets bigger, then the uh, the more probes you have to do to find the the more probes you're doing per key could increase, and therefore it's more bookkeeping you have to do to go back and get new new stuff, All right? And then at here at this point here, the reason why they all converge is that oh, we're at, we're out of the CPU cache. And then this way, you know, everything falls apart. Nothing, nothing works, right? Because the dominant, the dominant uh, cost in executing these things is is going to memory, not not you know how fast am I sending stuff? And then this is actually illustrates exactly what I, what I was saying. Like once everything's out of the cache, who cares, right? The, actually, the horizontal one does worse than the than the the scalar version. So this is why nobody nobody actually does this. All right, so let's finish up quickly. The, the, part, the, the histogram one. So this is a good example, another two, where again, you can show how you can use these primitives we built up to do more complicated things. And we can actually do this to do uh, histogram lookups and histogram, uh, histogram updates. So we're gonna be able to use scatter and gather to increment our counts in parallel. Um, but the tricky thing is gonna be, if we have collisions, the way they're gonna handle that is do replication. So this is our input vector. These are the keys that we have, and we wanna be able to update our our histogram and say we have an instance of this key. So they'll do a SIMD radix operation to extract out a, uh, uh, you know, some, some element of this, and then we use that as our hash index. And then we do an update into this, uh, with an add, into this, this vectorized uh, histogram here. But the problem is that uh, both key, key H2 and key 4, they both want to update the same slot. Remember I said that, like, you, you know, you, this won't work because it's, we're doing this a single addition operation to take all of this and update this thing. So that means that it's going to overwrite the, the updates. We're not going to be able to update the same thing twice. So in this case, we're missing an update because we're both writing to the same location. So the way they handle that looks a lot like a bloom filter in some ways, was that now they're going to replicate the histogram. And so every single, sort of, every single column here corresponds to what uh, one key or one lane uh, that we want to update, right? So this guy writes in this column, this guy writes in the second column, third column, and, and the fourth column like that, right? So then now, uh, and this corresponds to the number of vector lanes, so now we just use a SIMD add to compress all this and then put us into the, the form that we want, right? So I like this, because it's like, it's like a game. It's like, how do you take these primitives and take your you know, existing relational database operators and figure out how to use the SIMD primitives to, to, to do the things you want to do? Right, so I, again, I, I really like this paper. Uh, to finish up with joins real quickly, um, we've already talked about how to do this, this uh, uh, you know, how to do partitioning before, um, but now they're gonna show us how to do this with, with SIMD. We're not gonna go into the details of this, I just wanna show you, show you the results. And the, the bottom line is that they're just showing you that the, it, it, if, you, if you're doing the vectorized one, uh, you, you know, this approach over here, you get amazing performance. Right, but again, everything fits in your CPU cache, so it's not really real. All right. Okay. So to finish up quickly, uh, the, the the vectorization stuff is interesting. We need this for OLAP. This everyone will do. Every as far as I know, the, the systems that do vectorization, they only do the selection scans. They only do the predicates and uh, the vectorized predicates. 
Nobody, as far as I know, does any, anything else. Maybe some one-off things, like histograms, for example, potentially. But it's, everyone we talk to doesn't actually do, uh, you know, doesn't do joins in parallel or, or anything else. So um, the other thing, again, we've already said this before, but like you can take all the things that we talked about so far in the class. You know, these things aren't mutually exclusive. So we can take the compilation stuff, we can take the parallel scans and the parallel joins, we can use all that plus new vectorization to get even better. So I would say, again, if you're going to build a modern system, you'd want to do compilation, you want to do vectorized uh, predicates, and you want to do parallel operators across multiple cores. And being aware of the NUMA location, or the location in, in NUMA regions for the data you're operating on, so to make sure you schedule things in the right way. So I would say that there's, I can't point to one thing, say this is the right, this is better for than this, go to this first, all these things you sort of want. But I, I would argue that I think compilation will, will have a, a bigger bang for the buck uh, than vectorization because it'll, it'll optimize all possible queries where this can just operate the predicates. But doing co compiled in a, uh, a code generation engine is expensive. It's in, from a software engineering standpoint. Okay? All right, so next class, we're actually going to read a new paper uh, that I helped out with last year. Um, so this is actually now comparing the benefits you get from compilation versus vectorization. Uh, and in particular, we're going to look at sort of the hyper approach versus the, the, the vector-wise approach. Of the, do, you, do you have these pre-compiled primitives, or do you try to vectorize and compile things manually using the JIT stuff from the LLVM? Okay? And then we'll also talk a little bit about the technique that Prashant developed called relaxed operator fusion that allows you to do vectorization and compilation uh, for things that exceed the CPU cache. Okay? Yes? Why can't the pre-compiled primitives have vectorization in them? This question is, why can't the pre-compiled primitives have vectorization in them? You can. There's no reason you can't. Why are you choosing music? Sorry, they're not music exclusive. Oh. Yeah, sorry, did I say that? Oh, no, I just thought it was like implied. It, it's, it's more like the, how much benefit do you get one versus the other? Yeah. Okay? Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't no puzzle, I guzzle cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cross, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, you just don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the paint is red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. They go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the chili cheese. Be a man to get a can of snake pie.